Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we launch the spring 2021 webinar series on skills to succeed in the new work environment. 2020 has been a year to remember and has presented us with a new set of challenges to overcome. We at the Training and Development Solutions by Howard Community College are thrilled that you have joined us as we begin this series looking forward to a productive year ahead. Next, please. My name is Mina Wu, and I serve as the Associate Vice President of Continuing Education and Workforce Development at the college. Next, please. At this time, I would like to quickly share with you what we do at the Division of Continuing Education and Workforce Development at Howard Community College. Next. We offer a vast number of programming ranging from community development, personal enrichment, and workforce development. Annually, we serve more than 15,000 student enrollments in various courses offered at the college. We are here to enrich the lives of all residents in the county, as well as provide workforce solutions for employees and businesses. Next, please. As one of the workforce solutions, the Howard Community College has served the training needs of the businesses and organizations in the county and the state for over 20 years. Some of you may know us as the Charles I. Ecker Business Training Center. Eager to better convey the robust, comprehensive nature of the services we provide for our region's business community, including entrepreneurs, business owners, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and professionals who aspire to grow, the college announced our new name, Training and Development Solutions by Howard Community College late last year. We are excited to launch this new webinar series to help us launch the new name and to showcase the types and quality of training we can provide online as well as in multiple modalities. We look forward to our continuing engagement with you. And with that, I'd like to introduce Sherry Hornack to say a few words and introduce our speaker. Hi, I'm Sherry Hornack. I've been working for Howard Community College's Division of Continuing Education since 1998, 23 years. As the Director of Customized Training, I'm responsible for providing performance improvement solutions for our clients. Training and Development Solutions provides training, coaching, facilitation, and other performance improvement solutions to local businesses and organizations, as well as local, state, and federal government. Training and Development Solutions is physically located on the first floor of Howard County's new Maryland Innovation Center, which is on Columbia Gateway Drive in Columbia. Next slide. Training and Development Solutions provides customized solutions to the training needs of our clients in a variety of topics that you can see listed on this slide. All of our courses are interactive, incorporating adult learning principles and are robust with practical activities, training that's directly and immediately applicable to the participant's workplace. We will even incorporate your company's relevant examples into the scenarios, role plays, and case studies. All TDS trainers are selected for their subject matter expertise and their ability to share their practical knowledge in the classroom. Many have advanced degrees as well as prestigious local, regional, and national business experience. TDS trainers provide their course participants with information that has practical, real-world application. As a result, these trainers consistently received top marks from the participants for their preparation, knowledge, and teaching ability. Next slide. Our training services pre-pandemic were mostly face-to-face -face classroom based trainings. After the pandemic hit, we knew we had to offer our training services virtually. The trainers have converted all of our classroom based training into training suitable for the online environment. We also now have a partnership with a vendor of online self paced courses for individuals who want to train at their own pace. Once COVID restrictions are lifted, we will return to offering training in our classrooms at Gateway. 
And now I would like to introduce the presenter of our webinar. The webinar's title is Cross-Cultural Communication Confusion, Five Tips for Communicating Across Cultures, Languages, sorry, across languages and cultures. And the presenter is Brad Canerium. Next slide. Brad Canerium has a master's degree in applied linguistics from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He's been involved in teaching ling linguistics and English as a second language for more than 10 years, working both domestically and abroad. Prior to entering the ESL field, he worked in federal IT contracting at several companies across Northern Virginia, DC, and Maryland. And with that, Brad, it's up on you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry. Hi, everybody. Um, so like Sherry said, my presentation is uh, Cross-Cultural Communication Confusion, Five Tips for Communicating Across Languages and Cultures. Yeah. Um, so before we dive into the meat of what we're gonna talk about today, um, I just wanna lay out a few goals, things that I hope you'll take away from this presentation. So um, first, I wanna discuss what cross-cultural communication is and why it's important. Um, it's probably a term you've heard, but maybe some of the actual meaning of it is not quite clear. So I just wanna get a kind of a definition of what we're talking about. And then the bulk of what we're gonna to do today is I'm gonna provide five tips for communicating across cultures. Um, so when you leave, you'll have these five things that you can keep in mind as you're communicating in whatever situation you happen to be in. And then just in general, I wanna broaden your understanding of how culture and language affect communication. Um, it's things that we don't really think about in our daily lives, but they're hugely important, um, especially nowadays in the world we're living in. Uh, just a quick note before we get started, if you have questions as we go along, um, we have someone watching the Q&A, so use the Q&A button, it should be down at the bottom of your Zoom, I believe, um, and you can submit your question there, and then at the end, we should have some time where we can go through the questions and um, do some questions and answers. Okay, so um, what is cross-cultural communication, right? Uh, basically, what we're talking about here is communicating with a person from another cultural background. Now, when you talk about communication, this is a huge topic. So you have when, right? Are you communicating at work? Are you communicating um, casually, formally, informally? Um, what are you communicating about? You know, you're going to talk about different topics in different ways. Um, who are you communicating with? Are you communicating up to a supervisor? Are you communicating um, down to a subordinate? Uh, why are you communicating, right? Are you um, reprimanding someone? Are you making a request? Are you giving a presentation? And then of course, there's how you communicate. So the, the language, the words that you use. Um, obviously this is way too much to talk about in a single webinar. Um, so today we're focusing specifically on the how of communication, the language, what we use when we can communicate. Now, why is cross-cultural communication important? Um, I assume since you're watching this webinar, you're interested in this topic. So you must think it's at least somewhat important at a personal level, but um, on, a, on a more macro level, uh, it's important because of our di increasingly diverse communities, right? So here you can see some data from the US Census Bureau um, about some uh, counties in our region. So we have Howard County, Montgomery, Baltimore, and Prince George's counties. Um, and you can see it, it shows the, um, the percentage of people in these counties who um, speak a language other than English at home. Um, and you can see th these numbers are not small, right? Like a quarter of the people in Howard County speak a language other than English at home. Um, almost half in Montgomery County, uh, Baltimore a little less, but still a significant amount, and almost a third in Prince George's County, right? Um, so what this means is that if you're living and working and doing business in these areas, um, there is a very good chance you're going to have to communicate with a client, uh, a customer, um, a, a coworker, a colleague, somebody who comes from a different cultural and language background. Um, another reason it's important is because this move to putting everything online that we've been doing for this past year uh, is really op opening doors to more international work, right? You're dealing with people in different areas, um, more diverse groups, that you might not have worked with before. Um, and as you expand outward, um, it's important to keep in mind that only 7% of the world's population 
are native English speakers, right? We have this idea that English is this world language that everyone speaks, but it's really the vast, vast majority of people in the world are not native English speakers. And so you're gonna encounter people who have varying levels of English, um, varying levels of cultural knowledge, and um, you'll run into communication issues as a result. All right, so um, why should you care? Um, so I wanna just give a little personal example of how cultural communication can result in small misunderstandings that can cause big problems. So this is actually something I witnessed when I was working at a company years ago. Um, I had two colleagues at this company, um, Mel, who was from Kenya. Uh, his English was flawless. You know, he grew up speaking it. Um, he had a slight accent, so you could tell that he probably wasn't born and raised here, but his English was perfect. And then there was Julie, who was born and raised in Maryland and grew up here. Um, and I remember I was standing in the kitchen one morning, um, making my coffee and, you know, other people were in there too, putting their food in the fridge and whatnot. And um, Julie came in and she had just come back from vacation and everyone was welcoming her back and, you know, asking about her vacation and, um, you know, just to, making small talk. And then Mel, when it came, you know, she walked over to him and he said something like, did you have a nice vacation? You look like you've been eating well. And as you can imagine, this didn't go over very well with Julie. You know, she kind of turned red, she kind of huffed, and you could just imagine she was thinking, how rude, what, did he just call me fat? What did he say to me? Um, and she kind of, you know, huffed up and stormed off, and I remember the look of confusion on Mel's face and kind of the, the um, you know, people were standing around, it's just his mouth's open, like, did you really just say that to her? But he didn't understand what he had said that was wrong. Um, and this is a good example of a cross-cultural communication issue where his language was fine, but the thing that he said was not culturally appropriate for the American workplace culture. Uh, whereas in many other cultures all around the world, saying something like you've been eating well is a positive thing, it's a compliment. People would love to hear that because it means that you're looking good, you're looking refreshed and relaxed and healthy. Um, so this is where this small thing can happen. Um, it ended up becoming a big HR issue. They had to sit down with HR and talk through it. And it, it, it ended up being okay, but it was, it, it, I think it's a good example of why this is important. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the five tips for cross-cultural communication. So tip number one, the first thing to keep in mind as you communicate is separate language and culture. It's important to keep in mind that learning a language is not the same as learning a culture. Um, and this is what happened with Mel. His English was perfect. He knew English. He spoke English. He was an English speaker. But he did not have the same level of cultural knowledge because he grew up in another country, another culture, where even though he was using English a lot, he was experiencing a different culture. So the norms were a little bit different. Um, and this is true even of native speakers of the same language. Uh, if you've ever worked with people from England, for example, from the UK, um, you may have noticed little cultural differences and things like the levels of politeness um, and how they interact in ways like that, even though it's the same native language. Um, and really the key part of this tip is higher language ability means less forgiveness of cultural communication mistakes. And there's been a lot of research done on this where if someone speaks a language really highly, we just take for granted that they understand the culture. And this is what happened with Mel and Julie. Because Mel's English was so good, Julie took his comment as an insult at face value. Whereas if his English had been worse, if he had spoken broken English, strong accent, you know, made some grammar mistakes, she probably would have heard what he said and thought, okay, he, he means to say something like, I look good, I look relaxed, and she wouldn't have gotten as offended. So it's almost like this, this catch-22 for people as they, learn, as they learn English, because the higher their English gets, the more trouble they can get when it comes to um, cultural uh, communication mistakes. Okay, tip number two thing to keep in mind. Don't assume the worst. And I know it's, it's easier said than done in this case, um, so to, to talk about this, I want to bring up a little linguistics term you may or may not know, which is called pragmatics. And this just refers to the functions for which we use language. So things like making a request, declining an invitation, uh, interjecting your opinion into a conversation, 
et cetera, things like that. Um, it's, you probably never think about it, but these functions are heavily, heavily structured in the, in the language. Um, so like consider, for example, if you have to ask someone for a favor, right? Maybe you have to ask a coworker at work for a favor. Um, if you think about the way you would do that, there's almost always at least two parts to what you would say or write. So first you're going to have a, we call it a pre-favor, where you introduce the idea that you're about to ask for a favor because it softens it a little bit. And then you add the favor, what you want exactly. So uh, let's say you get an email from somebody and the email says this, send me the PDFs we talked about earlier, right? That feels too abrupt, too direct. It's missing the pre-favor. Or you might see this, can you send me the PDFs we talked about earlier? Little better, um, still kind of direct. You might feel a little like, okay, it's a little demanding, but okay. Um, or you might see this, can you do me a favor and send me the PDFs we talked about earlier, right? Chances are that third one feels the best. And that's because it's following that structure, that pragmatic structure of pre-favor and favor. Now, the problem with this is that the structure of the pragmatics are completely different across languages and cultures. So just because in English, we ask for favors in these two ways, someone from another language and culture might be perfectly comfortable being very direct and just sending that first one, send me the PDFs we talked about earlier. They would have no idea, unless they had learned the culture of the American workplace, that that feels rude and direct. So they might send that to you, not realizing that it seems direct. You might receive that and think, wow, so-and-so is pretty rude. You know, they couldn't phrase it a little more nicely. They're so demanding. And now you have this issue where both of you are unaware of what's going on, but it's starting to turn into kind of a, um, you know, a bad situation. Um, so for example, uh, um, Thai speakers um, don't usually use gratitude when they um, decline an invitation. But think about when you decline an invitation in English, right? What do you almost always start the, the, the um, declining with? You say, thanks, but mm -hmm. um, if someone comes from a Thai background or some other backgrounds, they might not realize that this is what we should do. And they might just say, no, or I can't. Um, but in English, we follow this certain structure. So again, if they're coming from a different structure of pragmatics, they're going to phrase it in a different way. And unless they've been explicitly taught or exposed to the, the English and American workplace way of doing this, they're not going to know that it's not correct. And they're not going to know that they've offended anyone. And how often, if you, you know, feel offended by what someone emails you, do you talk to them about it, right? So it's, it's just going to be something that simmers under the surface. Um, so don't assume the worst, think for a second, well, maybe this isn't meant to be offensive or demanding. Maybe it's just a different way of communicating. And this is especially important in the world of virtual communication. Um, nowadays, we're doing so much more via email, uh, messages like Microsoft Teams. Um, you know, before it would be a little better because the facial expressions, the tone of voice could soften what otherwise might be interpreted in a bad way. But now where you only have that text, it's super important to just take a step back and say, you know, maybe it's not meant the way it looks. Um, so don't assume the worst. Uh, and there's a good example of um, when you shouldn't assume the worst. And this is an interesting situation that happened at a airport in England uh, many, many years ago, where there was a misunderstanding between um, workers and customers in the airport staff cafeteria. So there was this cafeteria in the airport, uh, and this is where the you know, pilots and flight attendants and um, you know, baggage handlers and all the people who worked at the airport could come and eat. And the people who worked in the cafeteria, who served the food, there were generally two groups of them. So you had the native British English speakers who were born in England, grew up there, spoke English as their first language. And then you had um, a largely uh, Indian and Pakistani group of immigrants who spoke English extremely well, but it wasn't their first language. They had grown up in a different culture with other languages. And one day people in the cafeteria started complaining to airport leadership saying that these um, immigrant workers were rude. 
So the cafeteria lead, or the airport leadership went to them and said, you know, you have to be polite when you're working. You have to be polite to the people you're serving. And the immigrant workers said, We're, we are being polite. We're not doing anything different than our native uh, English speaking British co-workers. And they felt like they were being discriminated against because they were immigrants. And it started turning into a, into a whole big thing, basically. So the airport leadership said, okay, let's, let's look at what's going on. And they realized that it was a cultural communication issue. So what was happening was when customers ordered food, they would be offered gravy to put on their food. British people love to put gravy on their meat. Um, and when that happened, the native English speaking British people would say gravy, you yeah, know, with that rising intonation, which of course we understand means, would you like gravy? Yes or no? It's you know, kind of a polite question. Whereas the immigrant workers were saying gravy with a falling intonation, which has that feeling of being kind of direct, kind of rude, like gravy, take it or leave it. I don't care. Um, and this was all it was. The, the immigrant workers didn't, real, didn't even realize that they were doing anything different because it was such a small thing. And that intonation for them felt perfectly normal, perfectly natural. So once um, everyone realized this was the issue, they talked about it, figured it out, uh, the relationships between the customers, the workers immediately improved. So again, just a really interesting example of how you shouldn't assume the worst because here both sides assumed the worst. The customers assumed that the immigrants were being purposely rude and the immigrants assumed that they were being completely discriminated against based on who they were um, from something as small as intonation. All right, tip number three. Accent doesn't always equal language ability. So when you are communicating with somebody from a different language background, um, accent is usually the first thing that you encounter, right? It's the most obvious thing. Um, but it's important to remember that accents are the result of literally, in some cases, decades of muscle memory. You know, So someone has been speaking using these muscles in their mouth, their tongue, their lips, their throat in the same way for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And now all of a sudden they have to change how those muscles move to pronounce words in completely different ways. Um, and just because we don't usually think about what we're doing from a mechanical perspective when we speak, I just wanna show these three really quick videos. Um, there's no audio, so don't worry if you can't hear anything. Um, and just look at how the, the tongues especially move in these. So this one is German, right? And so you can see the tongue moving. You can see, look at how frontal it is, how it's darting forward and backward. It's tapping up inside of the mouth. It's very animated, right? Now here we have English. So you can see it's, it's got some of that like German, um, the frontal, but it's all kind of moving up and down a lot more, kind of going backwards a little bit more. And now we have Mandarin Chinese. Right, notice how much more of the movement is happening in the center of the tongue, in the back of the tongue, how it's going up in the center, up in the back. Um, you know, so think about how hard it is to move your tongue in a different way. Like if, if you're an English native speaker, try to move your tongue like you just saw the Chinese um, speaker do. It's hard, it is very hard. And so when you encounter somebody with a noticeable accent, a strong accent, um, what, ha what usually happens is it's this wall that we hit and we think, okay, I can't understand this person. Their English must be terrible, but that's not always the case. Um, there are, you might be surprised that once you get through the accent, once you get used to hearing how they're pronouncing um, different sounds and different words, it's quite frequently you'll realize that in fact, their English is really, really, really good um, because accent is not connected to that. You can learn grammar, you can learn vocabulary, you can learn everything about a language, but still have a very heavy accent. Um, so just keep in mind when you're communicating, um, cross-culturally that changing pronunciation takes enormous time and effort. Um, so try to you know give the benefit of the doubt with accent. Um, or maybe especially nowadays 
where video communication is compounding the problem even more. So now you might be dealing with accent and poor sound quality um, because of audio and video issues, uh, maybe transitioning a little bit more to text communication. You know, So somebody who maybe struggles because of their accent, suggest emailing um, so you can communicate a little more clearly. You might be surprised at how um, eloquent their writing could be in the language. Um, and don't forget the first tip I said, which is to separate language and culture. So it works both ways. Um, just because somebody has a thick accent doesn't mean their English is bad. Don't assume that somebody with a perfect accent is fluent and culturally aware. So um, another little anecdote that I personally experienced when I was working overseas, um, I was working in an office and I was the only American person in the office. It was all otherwise locals. And they spoke English very, very well, so the communication wasn't an issue. Um, but you know, I was missing kind of the little cultural touches, like you know, I couldn't talk about American football with anybody. Um, and then one day, a new guy started, and he came in, and he introduced himself. He said his name was Dan, and we started talking. And immediately, when I started talking to him, I knew, oh, another American, awesome, because um, his accent was perfect. You know, he, he was clearly American. And so we were making small talk, getting to know each other, and finally, I said. You know, so I'm from Maryland, where, where are you from in the States? And he said something like, the States, I'm from here, I've never even been to the US. And I was blown away because I was convinced that he was from the United States. Um, and of course, as we worked together, as I got to know him, I realized, okay, he doesn't really have the same cultural tendencies as me. Like um, the, the, punk, the rules for punctuality were a little bit different there. And he was kind of, he definitely followed the uh, punctuality cultural norms. Um, of the local country as opposed to the American ones that I was used to, so things like that. Um, but at face value, when I heard his accent, I just assumed that he was American, he had all the cultural knowledge that I did, but that wasn't the case. So remember to separate language and culture. Okay, tip number four. An interruption isn't always an interruption. So another little uh, linguistics term you may have heard of before is called turn taking. Uh, turn taking is a set of unspoken rules to avoid interruptions when conversing. Um, and it, this is just like pragmatics. This is something that we all do, we all know about. It's instinctive. You never even think about it, but without it, communication would be impossible. So, for example, in native English, um, especially American English, when we are done talking and we want to give another person an opportunity to talk, we instinctively lower our intonation at the end of our sentence. And when someone who is a native speaker hears that, understands you're done talking, now is my opportunity to jump in and start talking. And then when they're done, they'll do the same thing of lowering the intonation. And everyone does that, and it results in very little interruption. However, just like pragmatics, Turn-taking rules vary dramatically across languages and cultures. Um, there was some interesting research done uh, between British native English speakers and Indian English speakers and how they interacted and took turns in conversation. Um, and they keep in mind, they both speak English. So they're speaking the same language. They come from you know, at least cultures that have a lot of connection but they were dramatically different. So what the research found was that the British speakers tended to be very passive. They would wait and kind of like American, they would wait for a, a, a moment of silence and then they could jump in. Whereas the Indian speakers, um, culturally for them, what they would do if they wanted to take a turn is they would start to raise the volume of their voice, um, which for them was showing interest, right? Like, okay, this is an interesting conversation. I'm going to participate, I'm going to talk. Um, whereas, of course, the British English speakers worked, interpreted that as rudeness or anger because the voice is going up, like, why are you getting so angry about what we're talking about? Um, so this was a situation where you have two different strategies for turn-taking that were clashing and resulting in um, misunderstandings. And this is even very similar, uh, even very similar cultures can have problems like this. Um, if you've ever heard of Deborah Tannen, um, she's one of the main researchers and authors along communication. If you're interested in the topic of communication, definitely uh, look up her book. She's a New York Times bestseller. You can find her books all over Amazon. 
Uh, but she did a really interesting um, research and has a really interesting example about people from New York City and California and how they communicate. So she found that they also ran into these turn taking issues because people from New York City tended to be very animated listeners. So when they were listening, they would say things like, oh, wow, or oh, no way. Oh, you're kidding. Whereas people from California were very passive listeners. When they were listening, they would just sit and listen. And when it was their turn to talk, then they would talk. So when these two groups of people communicate, what happened is the Californians would be speaking and the New Yorkers would show their interest in what the Californian was saying by interjecting these things. Oh, really? That's interesting. And when the Californian heard this, they stopped because they interpreted that as, oh, you want your turn to talk. You're interrupting me, so you can talk. So then the Californian would stop talking. The New Yorker wouldn't start talking because the New Yorker was just showing interest. They wanted the conversation to continue. And so you had this weird, awkward you know, misunderstanding of turn taking. So it just goes to show that even people from the same country speaking the same language can have these issues. Imagine what happens when you're dealing with people from completely different cultures, different countries, different language backgrounds. Um, so just keep in mind that just because someone is interrupting you, it doesn't mean that they're trying to talk over you. It just might be a different turn-taking strategy. All right, and tip number five. Silence can say a lot. Now, up until now, we've been talking about the things people do say, right? The words, the intonation, the accent. But silence is a huge, huge part of communication. We use it in many important ways. Um, and so if you think about American workplace culture, right? Um, we use silent to show, silence to show respect. If someone's giving a presentation, silence is expected. Even if you're talking about something completely 100% relevant to the presentation, if you break that rule of silence, it's viewed as, as rude. Uh, and on the flip side, American workplace culture tries to avoid silence in informal small group settings. Like think about the, the, the last time you got to a meeting a couple minutes early and there were one or two people sitting at the conference table, for example, right? How, how many people will just sit down and sit in silence? Nobody, right? Somebody will fill that silence because it's just a culturally wrong thing to do. It feels weird, it's uncomfortable for us. But that's not true across the world. Uh, silence has many different meanings across languages and cultures. Some cultures have much higher tolerance for silence, right? So some, some cultures, they would be perfectly happy to sit down and have silence until the meeting starts. You know, whereas an American would probably feel so horribly uncomfortable with that. Um, and in some cultures, silence shows respect. Uh, so for example, in American culture, we value a lot of giving our opinion, even to superiors, right? If somebody, your superior is talking about something, um, they usually welcome, oh, okay, well, what are the, your, the ideas that you guys have and you wanna give your opinions and your ideas. But in some cultures, uh, especially East Asian cultures, um, that's inappropriate, right? It's better to stay silent because the superior, the person giving the information is the expert. They're the knowledgeable one. You know, you, who, who am I to say that I know better than them or imply that I know better than them by giving my opinion and my information? So they would sit silently. But of course, in an American workplace, we would interpret that as shy, doesn't have anything to say, not knowledgeable about the topic, things like that, negative things. So you might have a situation where the person giving the information is expecting input and not getting it and thinking, wow, so-and-so doesn't have anything to say on this topic. And the person who's not saying anything thinks I'm being very respectful, not realizing that the other person thinks that they have no knowledge about the topic. So again, you run into this misunderstanding. So um, just keep in mind when silence is being used or when silence is not being used, it's not always done in a disrespectful way. It's not always meant to convey what you think it might convey because it has many different meanings. Okay, so those are the five tips to keep in mind. So just a quick wrap up and takeaway. So as you leave the webinar today, keep in mind that culture affects language in many more ways than just accent and grammar, right? Like we've seen, it has so many 
uh, influences. And especially keep in mind that proficient language ability can mask inexperience with the culture. So don't assume just because someone you're talking to speaks pretty fluent English that they're going to know all of the norms, all of the cultural appropriate things to do. You know, so give the benefit of the doubt um, in that maybe they're not meaning what exactly you think they mean. And just a nice quote to finish up that I think just summarizes this whole topic and something we should all think about. Due to the fact that people are unaware of having learned their cultural behavior, they tend to assume that their group's way of thinking or acting is human nature. Um, and this is definitely true, right? You grow up, you communicate in a way, and for you, that's the way to communicate. But every single other person in the world has that same feeling about how they communicate. And recognizing that there are different ideas about what communication is and how it works um, can really alleviate and avoid some of these problems when two communication styles from different cultures, different languages clash. Okay. Um, so that wraps up my bit of the webinar. Um, almost exactly 30 minutes, very proud of myself. So I think we're gonna to move to uh, Q&A. Yes, so thank you so much, Brad, for your presentation about cross-cultural communication. We will now take a few questions. And as a reminder, you can submit your questions um, via the Q&A button. So um, the first question we have um, is, I'm a native English speaker. Sometimes I will compliment an English non-native on his or her English skills. Could my compliment be considered offensive by some? Uh, <laughs> that's that's a, an interesting question. Um, I, I, I think that's gonna vary person to person. Um, it's gonna be, depend on their, their history with English. I mean, their experiences before, you know, how sensitive they are to things like that. Um, I personally try not to. Um, but I, I think it, I try not to until I know that somebody is actively trying to learn. Like if I know they're taking classes, for example, in the evenings, then I might say, oh, wow, your English you know, is really improving. Um, but if I don't know the person very well, I might because I can see some people getting offended at that. Like if they've you know, if they consider themselves to, to be native speak, English speakers and you imply that they're not. Um, I could see someone getting offended at that. So I think unless you really know the person and their situation, it's probably better not to do that. Okay, our second question is, how does body language fit into cross-cultural communication? Uh, yeah, body language. So like I mentioned at the beginning, um, communication has so many aspects. And yeah, body language, facial expressions are huge parts of that. Um, and just like pragmatics, just like turn-taking strategies are different, body language is different across cultures. Um, the way people uh, show themselves, um, you know, is different. And if you think about how we use body language, like, um, you know, think about if you're sitting around a table having a, a meeting, um, if you want to talk, you might, you know, sit up a little straighter, lean in a little bit, and we interpret that as, oh, okay you wanna chime in. So it's almost like using body language as a turn-taking strategy, um, but that might be different in other cultures. Other cultures might be more laid back. Um, hand gestures can be different too. Uh, so it definitely plays a role in, in many ways, a kind of assisting the words that you use when you use body language in tandem with those. Our third question, it is so easy to get offended and not sure why. I'm sure people from the other culture may also feel that way. What is the best way to talk about that with each other? That's, yeah, that's an interesting thing. And I mean, that's, that's a, it's tough to talk about anything. Like if, like, you know, if you get an email and you think that email is direct, you know, how, how do you talk about that with somebody? Um, personally, I think it's better and again, unless you have a relationship with the person and know maybe what culture they're from and their experience and their background, what I try to do is just think, okay, maybe they didn't mean it like this. I don't address it with them completely, but maybe they didn't mean it like this. So I don't take it the wrong way and I give the benefit of the doubt. So I think that's the best way to deal with it unless you're very close with someone because it is hard to, to you know, broach that subject with somebody like, hey, why was your email so offensive? Um, I mean, that's hard if it's just 
to native speakers, uh, let alone introducing the possibility of offending on cultural terms. Okay, we have an additional question. Um, and again, we encourage everyone to submit their questions via, via the Q&A button, or if you cannot do that, via chat. So the next question is, what is the difference between cross-cultural, intercultural, and multicultural? Yeah, there's a lot of terms that get thrown around, and they are different. So multicultural generally refers to many different cultures, but it doesn't imply any sort of uh, interaction. Um, so you might like colleges, schools sometimes will do multicultural fairs where they'll have tables of different cultures and sharing you know, food and information, right? That's multicultural. They're not really interacting, it's just different cultures. So that would be multicultural. Um, Cross-cultural is generally considered where you are looking at different cultures and comparing things about them so like here, we're comparing how one culture would do turn taking versus another culture will do turn taking um, and seeing what's different, what's the same. And intercultural implies more, I guess, more of a two way where the, you know, it has inter like, you know, interacting. So two way kind of exchange of ideas and information between the cultures. So I would say cross cultural would be more surface level one way, like I want to communicate with you. Here's how I do it. Here's how you do it. Um, intercultural is more like sharing the ideas, changing each other's um, perceptions and ways of thinking. Another question. Um, this commenter mentions, I love your recommendation, never assume the worst. Would you recommend asking the person for clarification to help each other understand each other's cultural culture better, or is it better to just assume the best and move on? Uh, I mean, Again, I think it depends on your relationship with the person, especially if it's a work environment, you know, you need to be careful about, um, you know, things you talk about and offending people. But I, I mean, I think people love to share their culture. Like right now working at HCC and working in the ESL area, um, I, I see every day how people love to share their culture. They love when I ask questions about their culture. So I think if you have a comfortable enough relationship where you could ask that sort of thing, I think it's perfectly good because people like to to share where they come from and what they think and what they do. And, um, you know, and if you're interested in that, I think it's really good. And it might be a nice kind of a, you know, a bonding um, situation. Are there any additional questions? Oh, we have one more coming in Q&A. Um, awareness of difference of turn-taking behaviors and use of silence showing difference or respect are very relevant to the ESOL classroom. Are there things you would particularly highlight for native English speaking ESOL instructors? Uh, so things I would highlight about turn taking for ESL instructors. Um, I think the importance of the importance of not speaking over people in American culture is probably the, the biggest thing I think you should get across if you're teaching people about turn-taking um, because it has such a negative feeling in American culture, right? Like we don't like to speak over people. If someone speaks over you, you feel bad. Other people view them as rude. So the idea that although in other cultures, it's okay to raise your volume, speak over people, um, the most important thing in American culture is, you know, wait your turn, maybe learn some of the, the words that we use when we want to get into the middle of a conversation, you know, uh, things like, oh, like, you know, do you mind if I interject or could I just jump in here, teaching some of those phrases that we use, or even some of the body language, going back to body language again, like, you know, teaching them that you can sit up or, you know, look more interested or lean forward and that might signal to people that you want to jump in instead of doing, um, you know, something like talking over. Our next question. If a person is quiet due to her culture, she may be perceived as not having knowledge on the topic, and it becomes a vicious cycle to the point when this person talks, her opinion may not be valued. What to do? Yeah, well, and that's really the crux of the issue, right? Where if no one's aware of what's happening, like, you know, she, people think that she doesn't have anything to contribute. Um, and it's going to lead to negative results for her career, um, for, you know, her interactions with people. Um, 
I think asking, you know, I notice you don't communicate that much in the meetings. You don't chime in that much, but when you write emails, you, you always have great ideas. You know, why is that? Um, and maybe that could lead to kind of a discussion of, well, it's okay to, to chime in with an idea. You know, people do it. We like it. Even, even if it's not something we're going to maybe accept and go with, we love to hear all the opinions. Um, you know, so don't be afraid to do that because that's, that's how we do things here. This question, I am out of the state of Maryland. How and where do you study more about this topic outside of HCC? Um, I, well, so I mentioned Deborah Tannen. If you're interested in just the broad topic of communication, though her books are probably the, the best. They're super easy to read. You know, she writes them for kind of a, a pop audience um, and she covers, it's not just, you know, culture, but, you know, communication between genders and ages and things like that. So I think that would be a really good place to start. Just go on Amazon, go to the library and um, search for Deborah Tannen and you'll find just more than you could ever want to read about uh, this topic. The next question. I appreciate that you shared that there are even differences in culture within the USA, California versus New York speakers. But can you speak to the fact that culture can be even larger than where you were born? It can be related to the religion you were raised in, the age co cohort you are in, whether you have a disability or not. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a definitely a, <clears throat> an excellent point. Um, you know, culture is, it's everything, really. Um, and all of these things <clears throat> intersect with each other too, you know, like, so you have a culture based on where you're from, uh, your religion affects your culture, and, uh, you know, your, your parents' uh, views affect your culture, um, your friends are going to affect your culture, um, disabilities, um, your age, and all of these things are going to affect everything else. So, for example, your religion might affect how you talk, the things you talk about. Uh, your age might affect how you communicate, right? Um, I, I wrote an article for uh, Marilyn Tesol a couple of years ago about um, the differences between different age groups, kind of like what, what do you do when, you, when you're supervising people like millennials and Gen Z. Um, and when I was researching that, it was really, really interesting to see kind of the, the, you could call them cultural differences between the ages, you know, people from the same country, from the same city, from the same town working all together, but different culture based on their age. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge, huge, huge topic. It's endlessly complex because it's just this whole network of things that all affect one another and you can't have one without the other. Okay, Brad, I believe that is all the questions that we have. Um, thank you so much to everyone for contributing. Um, I'm now gonna transition it over to Sherry to close out the session. Uh, hi again. Um, I just wanted to end the session by once again thanking you for attending, but also for mentioning our next free webinar, which is in a couple of weeks from now. It's uh, Thursday, March 11th at noon. We will have a webinar called Building Employee Resilience. It's a very timely uh, relevant and important topic for businesses today. So we hope that you can join us um, Thursday, March 11th for that next um, webinar. And if any of you are interested in getting more information either from me or about the webinar, um, you can contact me at the information here.